The orbital zygomatic approach offers a wide angle of exposure for the management of lesions involved with the cavernous sinus, paracellar region, and upper clivus. Usual approaches for this lesion are the pterional and subtemporal approaches. The two main corridors while doing the pterional approach are the carotid oculomotor window and occasionally the optic carotid window. Both corridors have very limited exposure of the paracella area and the dorsum cellar region. Wider exposure is needed for uh, complex lesions at the pericella area and the dorsum cellar region. By removing the roof of the orbit, it's possible to change the inclination of the microscope. The orbitozygomatic approach provides access to anterior middle fossa cell like clivus region with improved working angles. Uh, it could be done in one piece of steotomy or in a two piece osteotomy. The orbital zygomata in two pieces combines the pterion approach with different osteotomies that remove the superior and lateral wall of the ipsilateral orbit and zygomatic arch. The patient is uh, positioned supine, the head is rotated. 15 20 degrees with the vertex oriented slightly downward. The incision is a short bicoronal incision which begins at the inferior margin of the root of zygoma and ends approximately 3 4 centimeters beyond the middle line. The skin flap is elevated. The dissection is subgaleal between the gallia and the periosteum. The frontalis branch of the facial nerve is uh, located in within the fat pad. Temporalis muscle is covered by two fascias, the superficial and the deep one. In between these two fascias is the fat pad, and within the fat pad is running the frontalis branch of the facial nerve. The subgalea dissection heads to a point in which the two fascias are joining each other. Usually this point is in, at an imaginary line between the zygomatic frontal suture and the tragus. Deep fascia covering the temporalis muscle is identified and the dissection is continuing along this deep fascia reflecting anteriorly the fat part together with the superficial temporalis fascia. By doing that, it's possible to preserve the frontalis branch of the fissure nerve. The temporalis fascia and muscle are incised sharply along the margin of the superior temporal line, leaving just a narrow myofascial cuff attached to the bone. The temporalis muscle is elevated and reflected inferiorly. The periosteum is incised and the periosteal flap is elevated anteriorly. Care should be taken not to break this periosteal flap which will be reapproximated at the end of the approach. The first step of the two pieces orbitozygomatic approach is the pterion flap. A standard McCarthy bow role is played just posterior to the frontal zygomatic suture. A second bow role is placed posteriorly along the superior temporal line. 
using an osteotome, it bone flap, pterygoid bone flap is cut. A cutting burr is used across the sphenoid ridge and the pterygoid flap is finally elevated, exposing the frontal dura and the temporal dura. The temporal dura is detached from the base of the skull and the bone is drilled. The zygomatic arch is exposed together with the roof of the orbit, lateral wall of the orbit and the zygomatic bone. After the pterygoid flap is elevated, the first cut is made across the root to the zygomatic process. Extreme care should be taken to avoid violation of the temporal mandibular joint capsule. The second and third cuts divide the zygomatic bone just above the level of the malar eminence. The inferior orbit of fissure is identified and I'll be a guide for the placement of the reciprocating saw. The fourth cut divides the superior orbital rim and roof. The fifth cut is a short cut made from the inferior orbital fissure to temporal fossa. The final cut is made into the lateral wall of the orbit. It's important to keep these cuts very deep in order to avoid the enophthalmos after the approach. And finally, the zygomatic orbital zygomatic process is elevated. At times, according to pathology, Small variations of the orbital zygomatic approach can be performed. For example, the removal of zygomatic arch or just the removal of the roof of the orbit. Once the zygomatic arch has been removed, the removal of the additional bone along the cranial base decreases the need for retraction. There should be no bone left between the orbit, the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe. And the dura of the temporal lobe is detached from the base of the skull, following the middle meningeal artery all the way down to the foramen spinosum. The dura is detached from the base of the skull anteriorly the foramen rotundum is in exposed as well as the superior orbit of fissure. On the lateral side of the superior orbit of fissure, between the greater and the lesser wings on the sphenoid bone, the periosteum of the orbit is continuous with the periosteal dura of the middle fossa, forming the dural bridge. The dural bridge is usually very short only 3-4 millimeters. The anterior canal process is located between the superior orbit of fissure laterally and the optic canal medially. The meningorbital band is resected until the superior orbit of fissure appears. The dura is gently peeled off the superior surface and the inferior aspect of the anterior cranial process. The tip of the anterior cranial process is completely exposed. With a cut timber, the anterior cranial process is removed. It's very important to keep in mind the neighboring structures. Medially, there is the optic nerve. Laterally, the superior orbital fissure with the oculomotor nerve. A deep down the field is going to be the paracline internal carotid artery. So it's very advisable always leaving a thin shell of bone on these structures all around 
This little shallow bone can be removed with a dissector, taken out with a pituitary forceps or a regular forceps. Once the anterior cranial process has been removed, the paracranial space becomes visible. The bottom of the field in the paracranial space is the clinoid internal carotid artery, which is encircled by the distal dura ring, the proximal dura ring. Medially is going to be visible the optic nerve, laterally the oculomotor nerve. In this paracranial space is completely extradural and extracavernous because the proximal dura ring is going to seal the cavernous sinus and the distal dura ring is going to separate from the intradural space. It is very important to drill away any uh, bony spur that will obstruct the direct visualization of the floral middle fossa. With the further dura elevation, foramen rotondo becomes visible together with the second branch of the trigeminal nerve. To further elevate the temporal lobe, the dura needs to be detached from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. It is very important to do this detachment in between the two dura layers which are covering the temporal lobe. The resection needs to be done between the periosteal layer and the dura proprio temporal lobe. This will allow, this maneuver will allow to keep the venous plexus intact and then will minimize the bleeding at this point. As you can see, the periosteal layer has been left on the floromial fossa and the two layers are separating from each other. This maneuver will allow the further elevation of the temporal lobe The middle meningeal artery is exposed and needs to be cut in order to allow further elevation of the temporal lobe. The dissection continues posteriorly in between these two dura layers. And finally, the temporal lobe is free from this attachment and can be lifted and separated from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Most of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus is exposed. The oculomotor and the trochlear nerve are visible, as well as B1, B2, and B3, the three branches of the trigeminal nerve. The Parkinson triangle is the triangle between the trochlear nerve and B1, the first branch of the trigeminal nerve, as the main entry point extradurally to the cavernous sinus. By elevating B1, the first branch of the trigeminal, it's possible to visualize the abducens nerve, which is running inside the cavernous sinus, coming from the Dorello canal. In most of the cases, the sixth nerve is attached to the medial side of B1. Just by dissecting in the paracranial space, right posterior to the clinoid internal carotid artery, in between the distal dura ring and the oculomotor nerve, it's possible to reach the pituitary gland extradurally. Fourth and third are attached, they're tightly wrapped by perinevrium. So the fourth needs to be separated in order to open a, a different triangle as a entry point into the cavernous sinus from the, through the lateral wall. The trochlear nerve is separated and the intracavernous carotid artery becomes visible until it continues to the paracranial segment. Once uh, the cavernous sinus is uh, fully exposed extradurally, there are several entry points uh, to access the cavernous sinus itself, so-called uh, cavernous sinus triangles. The lateral wall of the cavernous sinus is completely visible and is possible to see from superior to inferior the optic nerve, the paracranial space, the oculomotor, the trochlear, first branch of the trigeminal, V2, V3, the gasseria ganglion. The most common triangles are the superior, the lateral, 
the far lateral and the anterolateral. The structures of the lateral wall of the sinus are all visible extradurally. B1 can be followed all the way down to the superior orbital fissure, B2 to the foramen rotundum, B3 to the foramen valley, middle meningeal arteries cut to the foramen spinosum. And by opening the Parkinson triangle, it's possible to see the sixth nerve and the intracavernous carotid artery. By cutting the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus, it's possible to expose the basal artery in the so-called transcavernous approach. By cutting the posterior wall of the cavernous sinus, the upper two-thirds of the basal artery are visible from the mid basal artery with the branching off of the ICA all the way up to the basal tip. The dura is open in a circular fashion. Sylvian fissure is split. The region of the posterior canal process is exposed. The dorsum cell obscures a good visualization to the interpreduncular fossa in the entire region posterior to the dorsum cell. In order to achieve a good visualization on the basal artery and the entire region behind the dorsum cellae, the posterior canal process needs to be re removed. It is important to keep in mind the neurovascular structure surrounding this region, and particularly the internal carotid artery medially and the oculomotor nerve laterally. You can see how this uh, basal tip aneurysm is partially obscured by the presence on the dorsum cellae. Drilling usually starts in between the two posterior clinoids in order to minimize bleeding coming off of the superior petrosa sinus. The dura of the clios is uh, resected and the uh, dorsum cellae further removed. And you can see before and after remove the posterior canal process, different visualization, more proximal control of the basal artery. The entire region of the basal tip and dorsum cell is visible. It's possible to see the ocular motor on the other side, the SCA on the other side, P1 on the other side. Also, SCA P1 on this side is visible. This shows clearly how the posterior canal process is obscuring the region of the dorsum cell. Drilling the posterior canal process enhances exposure of the region.